Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to kick us off. Uh, welcome to this uh, CIPD coronavirus webinar. My name is Katie Jacobs from the CIPD, and I've been hosting all of our webinars on this topic for the past year or so. Um, and this afternoon, we're tackling a very hot and timely topic, evident by the number of people we had sign up and the number of people I can see that are still coming into the room. We've got well over 1,500. With the, um, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Um, so we're gonna be talking about the COVID-19 vaccination program and its impact on the workforce. With the vaccine program well underway, and I did check the latest figures this morning, I think it's 19.5% of the UK population have received at least one vaccine dose. There is hope on the horizon at long last, but there are a number of concerns and issues and questions for employers to navigate. And we're gonna be covering those over the course of the next hour. Uh, and joining me to kind of go through those questions and to take your own questions, I've got a panel of great experts. I've got Rachel Suff, Senior Employee Relations Advisors at the CIPD, Andrew Willis, Head of Legal and Advisory at HR Inform, and HR Inform is the CIPD's employment law resource. And last but not least, Matt Lenny, Director of Public Health from North Somerset Council. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, as ever, I'm just gonna go through some quick housekeeping. This session is being recorded. You will be able to access it afterwards. The slides will also be available to download and my colleagues will put a link in the chat as to where you'll be able to find those. If you'd like to submit your questions during the webinar, can I ask you to use the Q&A tab, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A tab if it's questions that you want put to the panel, but you just wanna connect with your fellow attendees, then feel free to use the chat function. And if you're doing that, can I ask you to set it to all panelists and attendees, because that means everybody can see your point rather than just the panel. Um, we're gonna probably get quite a lot of questions, I assume, given the number of people we've got on here. So we will try and group them and, and put them into themes uh, rather than addressing kind of very individual ones. Remember the CIPD Coronavirus Hub is there as a resource and that we're adding things to it all the time. We have a guide to the, um, to the vaccine, which Rachel will talk about in a little bit more detail, but I would encourage you to check that out. For legal advice, remember that CIPD members can call our HR Inform helpline. It's available 24 seven and get an individual response by using that resource. And finally, I want to flag our wellbeing helpline for our members in the UK and Ireland. Working with um, workplace wellbeing provider, Health Assured, we can now provide CIPD members with free help and support via sessions with qualified therapists online or over the phone. Health Assured have also launched an app, the My Healthy Advantage app, which in, allows you to access an enhanced set of wellbeing tools designed to improve your, med, med, your mental and physical health. And you can access those anytime, anywhere. So if you do need to talk to somebody, please do make use of that resource because it is there for you. On to today's session. As I said earlier, the UK's vaccination programme is rolling out at pace. In December, the NHS began administering the coronavirus vaccine made by Pfizer, followed by the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. A third vaccine from Moderna was also approved and there are other vaccines in the pipeline. However, it's worth bearing in mind that it's still likely to be a pretty long time before the working age population beyond vulnerable groups have been immunized. This is uncharted territory for employers and you as HR professionals are likely to be grappling with multiple questions. What are your legal obligations as an employer? Can or should you encourage your staff to take up the vaccine when offered? Can you legally compel them to do so, as some employers have already said that they plan to? And how can you deal with vaccine hesitancy in the workplace? Those are the kind of questions we're gonna try and address over the next hour or so, but please do get your questions in throughout and we will pick them up after we've heard the presentations. We're gonna hear from Rachel, then Andrew, then Matt, and then we'll move on to questions. So that's it from me for now. I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to kick us off and set a little bit of context. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to say how great it felt to prepare for this webinar. Just a few months ago, if you cast your minds back, we didn't even know that there could be a safe vaccine um, to protect people against COVID-19. And as Katie said, now that we've got three vaccines that have been approved for safe use in the UK, there are more in the pipeline. And I've checked my stats as well. And today, 
there's already over 13 million people who've received at least one dose of one of those vaccines. And going forward, it's clear that the vaccines will play a huge role in helping to drive down infection rates and protect people from this disease. But a mass vaccination program for the whole adult population, like the one that's currently being rolled out by the NHS, does raise a lot of issues, ethical, legal, practical for workplaces and of course for HR as well. And some of these questions won't be completely new to some employers. Some organisations like the NHS have been coordinating an annual programme of flu jabs for their people long before COVID came along. But now every employer will potentially need to consider some of the issues that this vaccination program throws up. And those issues, when it gets down to the detail, can be quite complex. And there are still some big unknowns about the vaccination program and the impact that it's going to have on the workplace. For example, the extent to which a vaccine will provide long lasting protection against COVID almost certainly there will need to be an ongoing vaccination, re-vaccination re programme. So what are some of the key considerations that employers and HR like yourself should be planning for? And I'm sure many of you will have already been thinking about some of these questions. If we could have the next slide, Christian, thank you. So these are just some of the key areas and overview of some of those issues. And first of all, Right up front, it's a good idea to think about a policy around vaccination because it is a big issue in terms of how it's going to affect your workforce. And this is an area that I think as well, employees will be looking for answers around in some cases. They'd be looking to see what your organisation's stance is. And by having a policy, you could already have one perhaps for flu jabs you could extend that policy to cover COVID-19 vaccinations as well. Or you might want to frame your policy um, within your framework for COVID secure guidelines. Um, but in that policy, it's a really important opportunity to set out what is your organisation's stance around vaccinations, um, your support for the vaccination programme that's been rolled out, but also within the policy, you can include really helpful links to reliable evidence-based sources of guidance that are available through the NHS and public health and so on. So I would see that policy as part of your upfront communication with employees and being proactive about this. And some of the issues that you consider in the policy will be similar to those that you have considered already if you've had a flu vaccination policy, such as time off, what's your approach to giving time off to people? But there will be differences too, of course. For a start, as you're probably aware, the COVID-19 vaccine is not available for you to offer as a private vaccine as an employer. It really is dependent on people being offered a vaccine as part of that national rollout programme. And then secondly, and this is an, an important point and it's, it's been debated in the media, encourage not require. You might have seen in the media as well, uh, another commentary that some countries are considering or have already made a vaccination against COVID-19 compulsory. But in the UK, generally vaccination has not previously been mandatory and there's no indication that this will change anytime soon. And ministers have been keen to re-emphasize that um, again this week. This means that it isn't wise to insist on vaccination without an employee's consent. It would raise a whole host of legal risks and issues. And I, I leave Andrew to cover those in more detail. However, Although it's the government and NHS and public health that are responsible for the successful national rollout of the vaccination programme, employers can play an important role in encouraging take up of the vaccine. For example, by explaining the benefits, why that employer thinks it's important in terms of providing a safe place to work and, and so on, although ultimately it is the individual's decision. 
And clearly most people will be very keen to take up the opportunity of that vaccine when it becomes available. Broadly, take up rates have been high across most of the priority groups where there has been an offer of um, a vaccine so far. But there will be a minority who will be reluctant to have the vaccine or refuse. Now, the reasons for this so-called vaccine hesitancy could be many and varied on the part of people in your organisation. For a start, some may not be able to have it for genuine medical reasons, allergy, for example. There's particular advice as well for pregnant women that organisations need to be aware of. Some people might have a phobia about needles and others may refuse on religious or philosophical grounds. And then there's others that may not point blank refuse, but may be nervous, may be reluctant for a whole range of different reasons. Again, they might be apprehensive about vaccination generally, um, or they might be nervous about this vaccination in particular, worried about its efficacy. There's been an awful lot of commentary in the media, um, a lot of uh, helpful information, but there has been a certain amount of misinformation circulating as well. And again, it's the government, NHS, public health, who've got the primary role in the UK for countering any vaccine hesitancy, but it is an issue that is likely to impact in the workplace as well especially if you've got people um, working with you who work with vulnerable groups, uh, as in health and social care. And it is understandable that as an employer, you'd want as many of your workforce vaccinated as possible to um, help build that uh, protection along with all your other measures as well in terms of having a COVID secure workplace. But there are a number of ways uh, as an employer, you can uh, promote uh, take up of the vac vaccination and, and communicate your encouragement if that, that is part of your policy. You could think about running an awareness campaign, for example, and draw on all that official evidence-based guidance posted, uh, pointing to the safety of the vaccine. I was looking on some of our community threads uh, yesterday, and I can see that some of our members are having helpful constructive conversations about this and how they approach the issue of vaccination and promoting a policy of encouragement and I noticed one large employer uh, is running webinars for staff um, enabling a QA, and a um, having senior leaders part part of that conversation even encouraging a local GP to be part of the conversation to provide that sound medical advice so there are all sorts of ways that you can help educate and inform employers, employees so they can make an informed decision that is their decision at the end of the day. And then on the fourth bullet, if there are concerns and people want to discuss those concerns in the workplace around vaccination, it's really important as an employer to listen to them and take them seriously and respect the confidentiality that there is around vaccination as well and prevent any potential stigmatisation if people choose not to have the vaccine. Any reluctance at the moment, I think, has to be appreciated in that wider context of what people have been living through for nearly the past year now. And a lot of people have had a lot of challenges over that time, and that hasn't yet um, abated. So we're in a period of heightened anxiety, I think, for many people. That needs careful and sensitive management and empathy in the workplace. And that extends to how we approach the issue of vaccination as well. And that also extends to the role that line managers play here, because they could be the first port of call, quite likely, if some people want to discuss uh, their concerns around vaccination. So hopefully that relationship is there, that culture is there, that will facilitate a trust-based conversation that's honest, that's confidential and so on. So managers do need to be briefed on the policy that you do have around vaccination, any awareness campaign, 
and also any potential questions and concerns that they might want to deal uh, with and if appropriate pass on as well to occupational and HR if appropriate. And then my final bullet on this slide is around time off. Time off in terms of uh, facilitating people to take up their appointment, pay time off if you can uh, support that so that people can keep the appointment that they're offered when they do become eligible as part of that rollout programme. Allowing that will also signal your uh, support for vaccination, but also wider time off uh, in a wider sense, whether you as an organisation can support those employees who want to give their time and volunteer as part of that national rollout programme. Thousands of volunteers have been trained through the NHS volunteer responder programme, uh, not to necessarily give the vaccination, but to help with that smooth running of the vaccination centres. And I know staff at CIPD have, have trained as volunteers as well. And I think that is a, to be seen in a really positive light if employers can, within the needs of your business, support that kind of volunteering so that people, if they want to, can be part of that national effort. And there's all sorts of um, benefits it brings to the uh, organisation as well as the individual. Next slide, please. Thanks. So the future, this is the question that so many people are understandably asking at the moment. Will the vaccination programme allow a return to normal working conditions? And I mean, first of all, I think we have to see the vaccination programme as part of a whole approach. It's not just the vaccination programme, it is all the other mess, um, measures and so on that uh, are facilitating safe workplaces at the moment. I mean, longer term, having an effective vaccination programme will make a huge difference to combating COVID-19. So as Katie said right at the beginning, the future looks a great deal brighter with these vaccines. They'll play a vital role as well in helping us to return to work in life that more closely resembles what we enjoyed before the pandemic. However, there's still a lot of uncertainty at play. So organisations do need to tread cautiously at this time. It's clear we'll be living with COVID-19 for the foreseeable future. It's not going to disappear anytime soon. We'll still need to develop effective vaccines on an ongoing basis uh, to give protection against any variants that emerge, for example. And then in the short to medium term as well, there are still a lot of questions. There's still that uncertainty. Although the UK vaccination programme is going well, it's proceeding at scale, it will take months to vaccinate the whole adult population of the UK. The majority of the people in those vulnerable groups, the priority list, those that have been vaccinated so far, aren't, aren't in the workplace meaning that we are still going to be living with uh, certain levels of restriction for some time, that includes in the workplace. That means that organisations need to manage the expectations that staff will have at this time, um, especially amongst those who might be desperate to return to that socially connected uh, physical space uh, that is the workplace. But there won't be a rapid return um, yet people should still continue to work from home where possible that is the guidance and it's important that organizations still carry on doing everything that they've been doing to ensure that covid secure workplace we will need to be led by government on any easing or, of the restrictions and we don't have that roadmap yet so this does mean that as more people in the workplace start to be vaccinated. Employers still stick to those socially distancing and other COVID secure rules to protect themselves and others. And these will also be very important as we move into a world where we have a mixed employee population. So those that have been vaccinated and those that haven't been vaccinated and some who may never be vaccinated. And that's one of my final thoughts, really, how important it is with that mixed workforce that 
organisations continue to support and manage that workforce effectively and not only from a safe perspective, the, the safety um, in terms of COVID secure, but in terms of inclusion as well. Everybody will have noticed that the, the debate around uh, the vaccinations can be quite polarised and that can potentially make it a divisive issue. People can have quite strong opinions on whether people should or shouldn't be vaccinated at all, who has, who hasn't. And that gives rise to the potent, for the potential uh, for there to be conflict uh, between people. This is why, again, I think it's good to have a policy and messaging up front about uh, what your expectations are around how people treat other people around this time and the need to be for everyone to be respectful of other people's views and to treat everyone with respect during what has been and continues to be a really challenging time for people. We just move on to the last. This is the last slide we've just published and I, I really wanted to promote this on the webinar. This is our guide uh, for preparing for the COVID-19 vaccination. It's an in-depth guide. It's free to everyone uh, um, who wants to download it from our website. I've just touched on some of the issues that the vaccination program does raise potentially in organisations and Andrew and Matt are going to cover some of those in more depth. But this is really um, a detailed guide. It deals with all sorts of areas like vaccine hesitancy, the legal issues and so on. So that is there as a resource that's really helpful for your organisation to deal with all, all those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was um, really, really interesting. I see a lot of people asking if we've got a um, vaccine te policy template. Uh, I know there is one available via HR Inform, um, which does have a bit of a uh, cost attached to it to access those resources. But I would encourage you to check out the guide and we are reviewing our content on the Coronavirus Hub all the time. There's loads of stuff in the guide that will, that will help you out and that is um, totally free access for everybody. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Andrew now, who's gonna give us a bit of legal insight. I can see we've got quite a lot of questions um, that are asking lots of different legal points. I think Andrew is going to cover off quite a lot of that now. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Katie. Hello, everybody. Um, and I'll begin by saying, um, as we go through these slides, you'll see that some of them um, basically come from the standpoint, standpoint that vaccines are a good thing, that the vaccination programme is a good thing. And really, I take that line because of the evidence we've had to date on that. Um, Pretty well demonstrated now that individuals who have uh, the vaccine uh, gain protection from it. And also there's some evidence now as well that the vaccine at least interferes, interferes with the transmission of illness from one person to another or the virus from one person to another. So that's, that's the line sort of taken. However, I recognise that different people have different views on vaccines and whether they're a good or a bad thing. And Actually, what we try and do in these slides and more broadly in this presentation is take a, a balanced approach and, and, and what we're always looking to do as employers should, at least it should be, um, respecting the views of both sides um, of, of this line and seeking to accommodate both as far as that's possible. So that's the line we take in the guidance that we give. Um, and also a quick note on the legislation that I quote, I do refer to a couple of pieces of legislation in the uh, in the slides. There is equivalent legislation in Northern Ireland. So what I say is good for Northern Ireland as much as it is for Great Britain. So if you could move on to the first slide, please, uh, Christian, thanks. So this first slide just looks at the law around um, medical treatment, potentially compelling medical treatment. And certainly at state level, there's actually no provision now that could require an individual to be vaccinated. Uh, that legislation that came in in 1984 that's quoted there states that members of the public shouldn't be compelled to undergo any medical treatment, including vaccinations. There is um, uh, a, a different area of law covering mental health care where that isn't entirely the case, but for our purposes, we can assume there's no legislation in place uh, by which uh, members of the public 
can be compelled to undergo any treatment, including vaccines. And of course, the government has had ample opportunity uh, to legislate to make COVID-19 vaccination mandatory, but it hasn't done so. And as Rachel's already touched on, we're not aware of any plans for it to do so. So uh, it will remain the case that individuals have the right to say no to this vaccine if that's what, if that's what they want to do. At an um, individual level or business level, of course, employers do have obligations at Work Act uh, to ensure a safe working environment for their employees. And the question arises, could this duty be relied on to justify employers compelling their employees to have a vaccination? Um, now, theoretically, that's possible, particularly given this emergency may well protect as well as the individual receiving the virus. However, see in the uh, slides that follow, that approach is uh, risky, it carries a number of risks, um, and there are many, many other things that you can do first uh, before, before seeking to compel somebody to have a vaccination. So that's what we'll look at, and it will be a very, very rare case indeed where compelling uh, somebody to have a vaccination would be justified, I, I, would, I would suggest at this stage. Um, and of course, when we say compulsion, what we don't mean is physically forcing anybody to have an injection, which of course would be a criminal assault. What we're talking about is seeking to in, uh, enforce vaccination by threatening disciplinary action, even dismissal. Um, but as we'll see, that's not a, an approach we'll recommend in the vast majority of cases. And uh, what we would recommend is that we seek to encourage rather than compel. Next slide, Christian. Thanks. So, under the Health and Safety at Work Act and equivalent legislation, the employer must ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, the health and safety and welfare at work of all employees. And that's particularly through the provision and maintenance of a safe working environment. So, if we are stopping short of compulsion, in inverted commas, then the best way to do that, and it remains the best way certainly during lockdown, is to ask employees who can work from home to work from home, because that eliminates the risk of them acquiring COVID-19 um, at work or passing it on to other people at work. So, of course, most employers are required currently under lockdown uh, restrictions to work from home, and that's the best way of ensuring uh, uh, the health and safety of employ employees at the moment. For those employees who cannot reasonably work from home, then the most important thing you can do is keep your COVID-19 risk assessment up to date, under review and up to date. This is something we'll all, we all will have done when we first invited employees back into the workplace um, back in, in late summer, I'll just take a risk assessment. But obviously risks change over time. Uh, Behaviour may change in the workplace. Uh, the risk presented by the virus may change. So do keep that under review and do involve your employees in developing that uh, risk assessment as you need to. And then in response to that assessment of risk, implement reasonably practicable control measures uh, in the workplace to protect your employees. For example, maintain and uh, change social distancing measures as you need to. And perhaps now consider a regime of weekly testing as well. Um, lateral flow testing uh, has its limitations. Uh, we're pretty much certain it doesn't identify all cases of coronavirus, but what it will do is pick up some asymptomatic cases of coronavirus. And if it's treated in that way, as a limited but still effective way of identifying some people who have the virus, Obviously, those people can then be uh, removed from the workplace, uh, can isolate at home, and that protects colleagues. And uh, I think it was the beginning of this week, this change was introduced, whereby any organisation with more than 50 employees can now join the government workplace testing programme and have access to those tests. So that's certainly something to bear in mind. And also consider training for employees and especially managers so that the messaging around distancing, around testing, and around precautions generally is consistent because doubtless some managers are being inundated with issues and questions around safety generally, but also vaccinations as well at the moment. So, you know, 
certainly consider keeping your managers trained up on that. Next slide, thanks, Christian. Um, in terms of vaccinations then, focusing on, on those, um, at the moment, as you know, uh, people are being vaccinated in order of priority and vaccines are only available at the moment to limited priority groups. As a result, right now, they just can't form part of the control measures you, you might introduce as part of a response to a, a risk assessment. Um, even if you wanted to compel someone to have vaccination, uh, the vaccinations aren't avail available to everybody right now. That will change over time, but that's the position right now. And only when the vaccine becomes more widely available could it even be considered that vaccination might be identified as a reasonably practicable control measure. So for now, you are or will meet your statutory obligations under the Health and Safety at Work Act by encouraging your employees to get vaccinated. Um, that may change over time. I think we're unlikely ever to get to the point where it's a requirement under this legislation or any other for employers to compel people to receive vaccinations. We'll see, we're gonna look at the risks of doing that in a moment, but there are no signs that the government wants to go that way. Um, and it will doubtless be met re with resistance. So the focus is, and will almost certainly remain on encouraging employees to get vaccinated rather than to do anything, anything more, that's more forceful. So a bit on compulsion, because I know that some employers have considered this, some quite high-profile high employers have considered compelling certainly new starters to obtain vaccinations, and they are tailoring contracts of employment um, in that way. If you're in a setting where you might consider it's uh, sensible to at least consider compelling vaccinations, do review the contract of employment you have in place, because some of them, perhaps in the care sector, may well include a clause requiring employees to have vaccinations relevant to their role. So for example, somebody who cares for elderly and vulnerable people um, may well have a clause requiring them to seek vaccinations for uh, illnesses, conditions that may threaten that population. But I would say even in a case like that, compulsion is a risky line to take. Certainly in most workplaces, it is a very risky line to take. And I'll list on this slide and the next slide a few of the reasons why. On this slide, we look at unfair stroke constructive dismissal. So a claim of unfair dismissal may arise in the context of a dismissal, if somebody is dismissed for failing to have a vaccination, or in the case of a constructive unfair dismissal where somebody resigns in an attempt to change their contract of employment without their agreement. Even in the unlikely case where unfair dismissal might be uh, defendable, um, you have to ensure you're in the best possible position to defend yourself by number one, justifying that approach in the particular circumstances that you find yourselves in. And I would say the, the hurdle that will be imposed by tribunals is likely to be high when it comes to that. So you, you need clear evidence of the benefit and the need for the vaccination in your workplace. Um, if you have expressly dismissed somebody for refusing to follow a management, management instruction, really the same issues apply. That management instruction must have been reasonable and the employee's refusal must have been unreasonable. And there will be many cases of people with uh, immunosuppress, suppress, uh, suppression as a result of medical conditions or, um, or similar. Those people will have good reason for saying no. Uh, pregnant employees as well, another example. Uh, you know, pressing on in circumstances like that is very, very high risk indeed. And always remember as well the need for a fair process, which involves uh, discussing the need for vaccination with the employee, giving them a fair chance to object, state their reasons, and obviously reach fair and balanced decisions based on the evidence before you. So that's that's the main risk, I would say, uh, unfair dismissal, constructive unfair dismissal, uh, for that reason, you know, going down the compulsion route is very risky. Also risk of discrimination, particularly discrimination claims around pregnancy and maternity and disability. And, and employees in those situations may well have valid reasons for saying no to a vaccine. Um, they may also uh, uh, 
have religious or philosophical beliefs that uh, to me they're, they're very reluctant to, to accept a vaccine and not want one. Uh, so risks of all of those claims, you know, if you if you go down the compulsion route, you'd like to be talking about indirect discrimination or disability related discrimination. So potentially you might be able to justify your treatment of an employee based on the wider needs of the business and safety of other staff. But again, difficult to predict how that argument might run in tribunal. This is certainly a risk you face. And then obviously just the general point about employee relations. You know, if you insist on uh, people having vaccines, based on what we know from surveys, in most businesses, some employers are going to have a problem with that. And their trust in the employer may well be adversely affected if they're required to accept a vaccination against their wishes. And then the last one of the list is the risk of a PI claim. Unlikely, because it seems the vaccine is safe. But no doubt some people are, are having adverse reactions, even if it's just a sore arm for a day or two or, or headaches, may need, may need them to um, uh, take time off. Um, you can't see uh, an issue like that right, giving rise to a PI claim, but there may be a very, very rare reaction that's more severe. So again, if you've compelled somebody to have a, a vaccine effectively, you may well have placed yourself at risk of a PI claim should that happen. So you'll have gathered by now that I'm, I'm not encouraging compulsion. In fact, I'm doing the opposite uh, in most cases. So the line to take really is to encourage your employees to have the vaccine, engage with them uh, and encourage them to uh, be vaccinated where, uh, where, where you can persuade them to. Um, and the approach you might adopt would, would include in a large enough organisation, perhaps collective consultation with other employers directly or trade union representatives. If you're talking to an individual employee about their reluctance to have the vaccine, find out why, what their reason is refusing because it may be based on a misunderstanding of the program make information available to them uh, about the vaccine program and why it's considered safe um, assist understanding by sharing uh, accurate and credible information perhaps lead by example so ask senior managers or if you're a senior manager yourself volunteer to get vaccinated when it's it's your turn to do so um, and obviously make it easy for people to be vaccinated as well. Um, don't necessarily insist on people booking vaccination appointments outside their normal working hours. Allow them time off during the day uh, for an appointment. Maybe depart from your usual policy and allow that to be paid uh, in the case of a COVID vaccination. And as I've mentioned, you know, mild side effects, perhaps consider paying people in full for any sick sickness absence attributable to a vaccine. Uh, again, which may depart from your normal practice, but which will certainly encourage those who may be hesitating to get vaccinated. And then finally, get a policy in place, as, as um, Brad was already touched on. Important to make sure communication is consistent and that everyone understands why vaccinations are important, what you're looking to achieve as an organisation. Uh, make sure they all hear, hear the same message. And that policy could include things like setting out your obligations as an employer under health and safety legislation. Why you think it's important that employees should get the vaccine. Perhaps keep records of vaccinations or obviously be aware of the obligations you have under data protection uh, legislation because that could be special category data and would therefore, you'd therefore need to observe, observe the particular requirements around that. Um, do you want to ask people to provide evidence of appointment dates and times to ensure people are having the va uh, vaccine? Uh, as, as I say, allow them time off and set out the, the rules around that in the policy um, and allow them perhaps pay time off for any associated period of sickness. Um, moving, moving on to the future, perhaps you might think about how you treat those who haven't been vaccinated in the workplace, but for now, that really isn't a relevant consideration because um, the guidance on distancing uh, and the like is not changing currently in the light of vaccination. So people still need to distance and follow all of the usual precautions. So for now, 
that hasn't changed. Um, so policy is generally a good idea because it ensures the message is consistent and everyone gets to understand the reason for your position on it and, and why you're doing what you're doing. So I'm sure we'll pick up some questions uh, on some of those points uh, at the end, but uh, for the moment, Katie, back to you. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, lots and lots of questions. I'm going to ask, because we are running short of time, if you wouldn't mind typing the answer to some of them, because I think some okay. will probably answer quite quickly, and then I will read them out as well for, for everybody. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Matt now, who's going to uh, tell us a bit about the public health response to COVID-19. Over to you, Matt. Thank you very much indeed. I will try and move through these quite quickly, just to... Uh, give people as much time for questions as possible. So thank you for inviting me to the webinar today. Uh, I, I'm from North Somerset, which I was just reflecting is not too far from Gloucestershire, which is where the original vaccine was, was born, a smallpox vaccine by Edward Jenner over 200 years ago. So we've been dealing with vaccines for, a, for quite a while now, um, but this one is obviously very live and very important. So what I've tried to do, if we go to the next slide, is just to um, restate why vaccination is important. I've said the chief medical officer here, I suppose I'm writing from the point of view of the English system. It's important to say that uh, some of you will be working in uh, other parts of the UK or indeed other countries. Uh, so uh, any of this advice is based on the local system and the local advice of your health professionals. So just to kind of say that at the beginning. But our chief medical officer has been very clear that COVID's not going to go away. and We're going to have to learn to adapt and live with the virus for a very long time. In terms of the vaccinations, there's quite a lot of noise around at the moment, particularly around the efficacy of some of the vaccines that we have. I think that's fine. We just have to acknowledge that. And it's telling the story in the sense that all vaccination programmes evolve over time. So you start with an initial understanding and then vaccines have to adapt to a virus which will adapt itself because it wants to survive. And the more that you immunise people and build, people build up immunity, the more it needs to find another way to get around uh, being blocked off. So it's just natural evolution. Uh, and I think putting it in that context perhaps makes people feel a little bit calmer about the fact that it's not just a COVID-19 issue. This is a, an issue for all viruses. We need to learn a bit more about vaccination in terms of whether it interrupts transmission. So we talk about giving vaccination to protect vulnerable individuals at the moment, and those are being prioritised appropriately. Uh, but ultimately, as we know more about whether it interrupts transmission, that helps us to plan a bit more about what restrictions might need to look like. So if it does have that wider benefit, then that would be a significant bonus for all of us. And I would expect that to have some impact in terms of workplaces as well uh, as well as other settings like schools, care homes, those sorts of uh, important places. Uh, and just reassurance that my expert colleagues in Public Health England, the pharmaceutical companies, the whole of the research world, is very much trying to look at this as a live issue as we go along and in the same way that they have done a fantastic effort in developing a vaccine in such a short space of time and indeed colleagues in the NHS rolling out a vaccine in such a short space of time that effort will continue to try and make sure that we are staying ahead and controlling the virus as, as effectively as possible. I suppose it is just back to that point about recognising that we've got to do everything we can to try and encourage people to take it up uh, so that they understand why it protects them and others from harm, but also understanding the fact that there will be those people who are a bit more hesitant. And I suppose I was struck by some of the comments by the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for England, Jonathan Van Tam, yesterday, who was talking about, particularly in, in minority ethnic groups, uh, we're seeing a challenge there about explaining the benefits of the vaccine more appropriately uh, and engaging with people who are be, who will be able to take that message out effectively as well. So it's always thinking about different groups in your in your workforce and how you're going to engage with them appropriately, as I know you do all the time. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Just a reminder that there's sort of three prongs to the attack, if you like, with vaccine as one, which is a very uh, fast moving and, and thankfully um, fast adapting program. But we also need to reduce the circulation of the virus full stop. And we're seeing some of that take effect now with the national lockdowns. Uh, numbers are coming down, both in terms of the general population and most importantly in the most vulnerable populations, for example, our over 60 population where you tend to see the worst effects of, of coronavirus if people contract it. So we need to keep going with that. And that is through testing, following up on testing with contact tracing and successful isolation of positive cases. So that's, that's a whole system that is running at the moment. Um, and it's also back to this point about the other wider prevention measures. So 
infection prevention control measures, which have been set up in lots of places already. So for example, our school settings, our care homes, uh, workplaces that are still open, which will have COVID secure uh, protocols in place. And as workforces may return to workplaces, it's about you know, being really prepared for that in terms of risk assessment and appropriate policies in place and getting the advice from the national guidance. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, that'd be great. So it's just a slightly different way of making that same point. And it's showing that a virus is with us, but there are a number of ways in which you can interrupt the transmission all the way through to the individual at the far end. So for example, if you, if you are unwell, then obviously you have to stay at home and keep your physical distance. Um, we use masks and face coverings. We use appropriate hand hygiene, uh, cleaning regimes. Um, people try and avoid touching their face. Uh, you limit your time in crowded spaces or avoid them altogether. And clearly in lockdown, that's um, greatly taken care of. But as we start to move into an unlocking phase, it's really important that we go back to those messages about these are the everyday things that do make a difference. Um, what we do have in place now is increased options around testing and strengthening the contact tracing system, which is really important in trying to limit the uh, transmission. Uh, we also have things like better ventilation, and I know there may be some uh, particular issues in certain employment uh, locations, so it's good to look at the latest guidance on that on your appropriate government um, website. We've also got to get the right messaging out there, and I guess this is a big challenge. We've been going for a long time. People are actually quite tired and quite frustrated, probably, by a lot of the restrictions in place. We've got to be honest about that. So I guess it's how do you refresh the messaging, make it relevant, make it feel possibly a bit more aspirational about, well, you know, if we do keep going with some of these things, then there is a reward. We will start to get a bit more of our life back. Um, but we also need to be able to support those people who have to self-isolate uh, and make that effective. Quarantine and isolation is a hot topic at the moment. You'll see all of the new announcements about um, people coming in and out of the UK and what restrictions may be in place. Uh, and of course, vaccination. So it's just seeing there's a whole suite of activity that is going on. And all of those things are important in their own right. But together, if we get them right, they are our best chance of moving towards a, a slightly more familiar uh, way of working and living in our communities. In terms of the next slide, I was just sort of picking up, there are lots of information and on my first slide, I was just acknowledging um, colleagues in Hertfordshire County Council produced some really useful um, briefings and materials. And there's a link there on that slide. Uh, there are also some good resources on the Public Health England uh, Campaign Resource Centre, um, whether that's posters that can be adapted, there are social media clips, there are some good interviews with experts um, giving key messages about vaccination and why it's important and how to encourage people to take it up. So we can signpost to some of those. But for example, here there's video resources, there are podcasts, there are specific guides, um, Q and A type resources. So uh, I'm just saying that that would be, um, you know, good. There are a number of good sources out there and do use them to help, um, you know, make exact decisions about your own policy. And then just going on to the last slide, just to explain something about um, each each of you will sit within a local area and within each local authority area there will be a, uh, there's a local outbreak management plan and within that are a number of work streams so just to give you confidence that we are actively doing things around out outbreak management so we are working with um, schools care homes and workplaces to support them to uh, effectively deal with clusters or large-scale outbreaks of, of the virus and that will continue uh, exactly the same with testing. So we've got the PCR testing, but we've also got the lateral flow testing, which is being expanded now. Some of that's run by local authorities. And I know there is an offer now to all employees, oh, sorry, employees with uh, more than 50 employees. We have contact tracing and that is being enhanced in terms of uh, local systems through local public health teams, as well as through, for example, in England, the uh, NHS Test and Trace Programme. We also do a lot of work around insight, communication and engagement, so trying to reach out to our communities. So through um, employment is one place of contact, if you like, with a, a, a sort of uh, a source of information and fairly authoritative information. But we're also looking for other ways to reach people, whether that's through local democratic structures, through voluntary community sector or, or, or other mechanisms. We also do a lot around enforcement. So what my role also covers regulatory services so that 
that will be about issuing fixed penalty notices, that will be about closing certain establishments if that's appropriate, but because they're not adhering to rules, so we are trying to keep people safe and well as much as possible. And we do a lot of surveillance and intelligence, that's trying to think ahead. What are the patterns? What's showing in terms of different rates of um, acceptability of behaviours? And indeed, it will be around vaccination as well and try to do additional work for those people who are less likely to take it up. And then underneath that, we've got the whole work, and now it's our colleagues in the NHS who run the vaccination programme, but local public health level, we try and work with them to enhance those messages and support and, and work in our local communities. Uh, and then it's actually the voluntary community sector. I think it's really important to recognise that they are doing an awful lot out there to reach those people who are harder to reach or who they who may be more vulnerable and it may be that within workplaces uh, you can think about ways that you can link in with those types of organizations because as we know people are employees but they are people living in families in communities with vulnerabilities around their their, their families their friends uh, so the more that we can all say the same things in a consistent way uh, the, the more likely we are to get to a better place quickly so uh, thanks for your time i'll just stop there Thank you so much, Matt. Brilliant. And lots of people asking for those resources. Uh, I think my colleagues put them in the chat, but also the slides will be available. Right. See, Andrew's been diligently answering some questions behind the scenes, but I'm going to uh, try and group a few and get as, for as many as we can in about 10 minutes. Um, so we've had a lot of questions um, around recording evidence of vaccination. Is that something to be encouraged? Can you track who's had it? Can you ask people where they've had it? And then if you are asking people whether they've had it, do you then, is that a GDPR issue in terms of uh, storing private medical uh, data? Andrew, a uh, quick view on, on tracking or recording evidence of vaccinations. I think it is a reasonable thing for an employer to do um, because it feeds into ensuring a, so, a safe working environment for that employer and all other employees, potentially. Uh, but that kind of information is special category data. And so, um, I'm not going to delve into data protection law on, on, on the webinar because it's such a, a complex area, but certainly be aware that it's special category, category data and you need to be careful about how you store and process it. Thank you. Um, Rachel, I'll come to you on this one first. We had a few questions about kind of working relationships and potential conflicts. So how do you deal with it if somebody says, I don't want to work with, with that colleague because I know they haven't been vaccinated. I don't want to be in the same room or building as them. How do we deal with these kind of issues? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And it's exactly the kind of issue where conflict can, can arise. And I, I think that's why organisations do need to think about their policy and their approach and the sort of expectations around behaviour right up front and message that quite um, proactively to people. And also emphasise that not everything, that the debate around the vaccination programme has become quite narrow. And really, um, organisations need to sort of widen it out again to the point that attending a workplace or not shouldn't rest on whether you've had the vaccination or not and spell out and emphasize all the other, it is a part of a, a raft like the Swiss cheese diagram that Matt uh, showed us. It's only one of the uh, ways to keep people safe at work. There's, there's the testing, there's um, the PPE, there's the, you know, all the other measures. So it's only part of um, the whole piece. And just that piece as well about confidentiality. And I know people will talk about who's been vaccinated and not, but actually it's, it's your own choice and there's confidentiality around that. Thank you. Um, Matt, we've had a few um, people saying, talking about rumours that are kind of circulating in their in their workplaces. So one person's got quite a lot of young female em employees and they're hearing these rumours about infertility. There's also the kind of rumours going around the religious um, community, even though a lot of religious leaders are, are coming out and saying that those are untrue kind of around animal products. Um, have you got any advice on how you address those kind of common rumours? Yeah, I think, well, you have to acknowledge them. That's the important thing because um, they're real. Uh, but it's going back to the guidance and some of the resources that have been produced in terms of explaining, actually, that, that they're not they're not true. Um, and it, so it is about having a conversation. Um, but I, I think, I, you know, there's a number of resources that we could probably signpost people to. Um, for example, the ones I talked about, the PHE um, Campaign Resource Centre. 
which go through that explanation. So it's it's making those resources available to people to bust some of those myths uh, and uh, you know deal with it. And then if people still have questions after that, then maybe then we can get more detailed information to them. But uh, it's trying to deliver it in a way that is um, not not threatening or judgmental. It's quite open, and so that's why some of those resources are good because they're much more conversational. They're much more um, user friendly, if you like. And for example, I've seen some on the BBC website which are very much directed to younger ages, so um, delivered by people that they would recognise as their peers rather than slightly more older, boring looking people like me. So it's uh, you know it's picking the right messenger as well as the message. I think. Thank you. Um, Andrew, we've got a few questions around um, what, where do you stand if you've had employees that are shielding, they haven't been able to work from home, so they've probably been furloughed. Now they might have had their first dose of the vaccine. Can you ask them to come back or if they want to come back, but you don't feel comfortable about that, where does an employer stand? I think if we're talking about clinically extremely vulnerable employees, I would recommend that you seek um, medical uh, information from the employee's doctor. So treat it as you might do a uh, a fairly straightforward capability situation. I appreciate it's not, but the approach would be the same. So you'd be looking for medical evidence from that person's GP or consultant, or if necessary, from an occupational health uh, provider, just to ask around about the risks around them returning and what you would need to do, what uh, measures you might need to take to protect them, and then base your decisions on the information you get back from those, from those experts. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll stick with you, Andrew. Um, we have a few people asking about... Um, what if you work in a very specific sector, such as uh, people citing kind of health and social care, you're working with vulnerable people, can you, uh, can you compel, do you have a stronger case for compulsion then? You certainly have a stronger case and, you know, if, if there were any, any uh, environment where it might well be a reasonable management instruction to ask somebody to get vaccinated, it would be in the case of somebody who's working with vulnerable uh, people. Um, again, you know, you would need to follow a fair process. That means setting out the consequences potentially if somebody doesn't get vaccinated, allowing them a chance to respond, considering their responses because they may well have good reasons for saying no. Um, but ultimately that might be a case where a dismissal might be contemplated ultimately, but only after a, a fair process has been followed and only after taking into account the information you've been given by that employee. Thank you. Um, Rachel, a few people suggesting, is it, um, is it a good idea to offer kind of bonuses or incentives for people to get vaccinated? Is that a, a solution we'd advise? Ooh, I, I, think you, I think that's a bit different to encouragement. I mean, an interesting question and, a, you know, I can really understand employers wanting to do everything they can to encourage take up of the vaccine, but um, bearing in mind that some people can't have the vaccine, I mean, could there be um, implications there for treating some people more fa favourably? Um, so I'd, I'd be careful around actually offering incentives, which is different to allowing uh, people time off and paying for people to have um, that time, you know, paid time off to have the vaccine, but actually giving a monetary reward. I, th I think that raises different questions. I don't know what you think, uh, Andrew. I agree with you that the, the risk is that essentially what you're doing there is you're imposing a detriment on somebody who cannot have the vaccine, maybe for very good reason related to uh, disability or the like. So it, it's probably something I'd recommend avoiding. Thank you. Um, Matt, we've got um, a, quest a couple of questions about um, do you envisage that the kind of social distancing measures that we have in place in, in workplaces at the moment and all the COVID secure stuff that's been put in place, is that likely to be around for a long time, even if people are getting vaccinated? I think we have to think in that way. I mean, because it's not exactly clear at the moment. There are a few variables in there. So it's about what's happening with case rates in the community. It's about the rate of the vaccination rollout. It's about whether the vaccine might um, interrupt transmission as well as protect an individual. So there's a lot of moving parts there. So I think we probably do need to think about having workplaces with social distancing measures in place for some time. Very hard to say for how long, but I guess realistically, you should probably plan for the, the, the hardest scenario and then work your way backwards. You might have a series of steps whereby uh, if guidance changes nationally, and it is going back to guidance in all of these stages, um, it might then be able to say, you know, that might say, well, you can adopt a slightly different regime because we now think we're at this point. 
Um, what essentially what we need to be at is where there are much less cases in the community and when they come up we're able to move really quickly to uh, isolate that individual contact trace around them, isolate other individuals and test as appropriate and know that we've nipped it in the bud essentially um, and we're quite distanced from that at the moment given the numbers that we still have. Thank you. I'm aware we're at time. I'm going to ask one more question because we have quite a few about it. Um, I'll just put it to you, Andrew. I think it's a legal issue. If you're a kind of third party, um, a supplier to another organisation, can and that other organisation is saying, I insist that your employees that are working on our sites are tested, I'm insisting they're vaccinated. Um, where, what's the situation there? Um, that's essentially about the agreement between the uh, employer and their client um, and it's, it's a commercial it's a commercial uh, issue really can you rely on that to support action taken against your employees potentially but only in the most extreme cases so for example um, you would try and redeploy somebody who either wouldn't be vaccinated or, or wouldn't confirm they'd been vaccinated rather than look to go down a dismissal route save in the most extreme circumstances so you'd look to work with your uh, business partner but at the same time uh, be fair to your employees and you know accommodate them in other ways. Thank you um, and we've also I want to acknowledge that we had a lot of questions about testing um, I haven't picked them up because we our next webinar is going to be on testing we haven't got a date for that yet because we're still um, kind of assessing speaker availability but uh, watch this space I promise it will be um, as soon as uh, we can possibly make that happen. Um, thank you so much to Rachel, Matt and Andrew for your insight uh, thanks everyone for your literally hundreds of questions uh, tried to, uh, sorry we didn't answer them all um, we will consider coming back and doing another session that is just a Q&A session so without presentations just to give you an opportunity to ask questions of people the slides will be available to download we'll also download the questions that have been answered by typing and we will share those with you as well um, and like I said we will uh, think about what other content we can give you but in the meantime do check out the the coronavirus hub and the vaccine guide because it is um, really good it's full of really brilliant information um, so that is it from us for now we don't have another webinar next week the testing one will be the next one watch this space and where that will be personal uh, I won't be around anymore because I'm nine months pregnant so I've only got about a week left to work so it's been a pleasure to uh, host all of these for the last year and I'm sure you'll be in very good hands uh, once I'm off um, but that is it from us for now hope that was useful and we will see you next time goodbye